Today's attack widened the Gulf War to its most dangerous location yet, near the coast of Saudi Arabia. The 210,000-ton Saudi tanker Yambu Pride was hit from the air. The captain describes what happened. We get explosion on the deck and uh, rockets uh, around the vessel. Two of them hit the vessel, but uh, fortunately we are all safe, no casualties. Today's incident occurred only a few moments flying time from two of Saudi Arabia's crucial economic centers. The main oil loading terminal at Ras Tanura and the nearby petrochemical complex at Al Jubail, without which the Saudis would have to abandon their long-term survival plan of industrial self-sufficiency. Western oil sources have told ABC News that as recently as yesterday, Saudi Arabian oil minister Sheikh Yamani was privately pessimistic and predicting Iranian reprisals against Arab Gulf states would support Iraq. In Tehran today, the Speaker of the Parliament, Rafsan Jani, threatened an even wider crisis by saying that if the Iranian oil terminal at Karg Island is not safeguarded, then no other routes in the Persian Gulf would be secure. International shippers, especially the Japanese, are extremely nervous, say oil industry sources, but that most companies and countries will not formally avoid the Gulf unless there's more widespread damage or loss of life. U.S. government sources say the tanker was outside of Saudi territorial waters when it was attacked by two American-made F-4 Phantoms belonging to Iran. Military sources say an American AWACS early warning plane operating out of Saudi Arabia monitored the whole thing on radar. The Iranian fighters flew across the Persian Gulf, circled the Saudi tanker, apparently wanting to make sure it was the right ship, then attacked. U.S. sources say the Saudi Air Force scrambled F-15s, but they arrived at the scene too late to do anything. Analysts are not sure if the Saudis got to the scene late because it all happened so fast, or because they had no desire to actually tangle with Iran. Officials say the last thing Saudi Arabia wants to do is get drawn into a war with Iran, and to avoid such a thing, some analysts believe the Saudis are probably willing to lose a few tankers. The scene was horrific. Damage to people and vehicles was so severe that rescue workers had trouble sorting it all out. Early reports put the number killed at three, but this was later reviewed too. The accident happened at 8.15 on the New England Highway at Pike Scully, 15 kilometres south of Muscle. Police say one semi-trailer crashed into the other vehicles. They had stopped or were moving very slowly near roadworks. One of the cars crushed between two semi-trailers in the impact was reduced to a metre and a half from its normal length. Killed was an 11-year-old boy who was asleep in the rear compartment of this blue Ford Louisville truck. The other dead man, aged 50, was the driver of one of the cars. A 40-year-old woman was cut from the wreck by rescue workers. She was flown to Royal Newcastle Hospital by the Westpac rescue helicopter she is suffering serious head and head injury. Three other drivers were taken to Singleton Hospital. They're all in a satisfactory condition. There was some good news. The driver of this white Sigma, Mr. Graham O'Rourke, walked away without a scratch. The rear of his car was damaged as the semi ran up the back. Ironically, he had just overtaken the line of traffic. David Walter Zimmerman of Beecroft Street, Warners Bay. Police say he was riding his push bike to work at Lambton Beat Colliery at Redhead. It's believed he was walking the bike up the hill in Oakdale Road, Gateshead, when he was hit by a vehicle from behind. Scientists, squad detectives, estimate the time of the accident was just after 6 o'clock this morning. The man's body wasn't found until an hour later. The man had suffered serious head injuries, and police believe he died instantly. Charlestown Police are following a number of leads that have called for help from the public in locating the offending vehicle.
The council convened the meeting last night to discuss complaints from Walden residents and to review coal haulage routes through the area. It's claimed that some coal trucks passing through Walden are not using designated roads. This was challenged by the representatives of the Transport Workers Union. Other groups involved in the talks last night were the Coal Association, colliery proprietors and truck operators. It was agreed that the established coal route through Walden could be maintained. Those involved in the haulage of coal pointed out that other heavy vehicles were not obliged to pick the route that the coal trucks used. But the complaints by residents have been referred to the Coal Transport Advisory Committee, which reports to the Minister for Roads and Water Heritage. The city engineer, Mr Grayson, indicated that coal haulage routes may need to be reviewed, subject to proposed grade improvements in Walden. Another meeting will be held in six weeks, when Mr Grayson will bring forward a report on road development plans in the area. The One Egg Drama Festival got underway last night at the Arts Drama Theatre of the Newcastle University. The Council Repertory Group presented the first two plays, including Space Between the Years by John Scholes. The festival will run until Saturday night. During the final afternoon, there will be a six-play matinee starting at noon. Prizes to the winning performance will be presented by the adjudicator, Mr Ken Boucher, a freelance producer-director. Free admission will be given to pensioners, unemployed and the disabled. Organiser Mr Kevin Doyle says this year's festival is shaping up to be a good weekend of entertainment. Looking at the programme and looking at the names of the groups and the plays they have chosen, it prompts us to be very good. like a birdcage with bicycle wheels, but the thinking behind it is advanced. The Mechanical Engineering Department at Newcastle University is backing this attempt by teacher Hank Willems and seven students to take out a class victory in the mileage marathon at Amaru Park on June the 3rd. Their brainchild will join 32 other spindly vehicles in We can go to the trouble of enclosing the wheel. This prevents turbulence from the spokes slowing the vehicle down. Driven by event. a man or woman, Victoria's seems in many cases to be an afterthought. Took second place with nearly so much of the engine is extremely important. Try and in most cases, they're converted model the aircraft motors. Has welded a chassis from aluminium television antenna tubing that weighs only four kilograms. The wheels are from racing bicycles, and the tubeless silk tyres are of Olympic standard to offer the lowest rolling resistance. Low air resistance will be ensured by wrapping the frame in heat shrink plastic. Power is by a modified 10cc model aircraft engine, and at certain points on the circuit, it will be turned off so the vehicle can coast. This is the university's third attempt at the mileage marathon. In 1981 and 1980, a much larger vehicle achieved 800 miles per gallon, but this team is aiming at the Chisholm Institute of Technology's mark of 2,500 miles per gallon. You must have luck around the issue because it's the development time to get all the little snags out that is sadly lacking. A 22-year-old city man became trapped on a steep slope after crashing his hang glider at Murdering Gully. The man suffered bad leg injuries and could not move. He was assisted by a companion until help arrived. Paramedics, police and the rescue helicopter crew managed to ease the injured man onto a stretcher and carry him 100 metres to the beach. He was rushed to the Royal Newcastle Hospital with injuries to his upper left leg. His condition is satisfactory.
Alan Tater said his people need basic life support techniques. More lives could be saved. In accident situations, the ability to stop profuse bleeding and carry out heart massage and resuscitation could save a life. But according to rescue officials, there are situations where eyewitnesses at the scene of a crash look on helplessly in the critical moments before medical help arrives. Paramedic ambulance men suggest that motorists should be compelled to learn life support measures. If we look at other areas in the world, uh, perhaps Seattle in the United States, we see uh, there that prior to obtaining a driver's licence, you must have a basic life support certificate. And currently in that city they have 60% of their uh, population trained. Do you think that that would be feasible in the government's eyes? Well, that depends, but certainly it's a place to start. Uh, we would like to see areas such as, um, say, the coach companies uh, that are applying the East Coast highways of, uh, of Australia, who are on these roads day and night, uh, perhaps their, their people in charge of these coaches could be trained in, the, in these procedures. So why do you think there's a need for motorists to know first aid? Well, I think uh, perhaps graphically over the past week we've seen situations where uh, young people have been involved in tragic situations where their lives most certainly may have been saved had someone known something about basic life-saving procedures. And I speak in particular of uh, perhaps arresting torrential hemorrhage. We feel that if people would only sort of uh, apply basic knowledge that uh, indeed there would be many, many lives saved. I caught up with Eddie at Swansea's Workers Club today while he was polishing up several of his trick shots. Well, should you ever be playing a game of snooker and be on the blue, but unfortunately find yourself in this position, the best way out of the snooker would be to play the shot like this. And eventually all eight reads to finish up in this corner. But the three current world match play champion, world open snooker champion, three times winner of Pot Black, and has played in four finals of the World Professional Snooker Championship. Recently in that tournament, he was eliminated in the quarter finals. Steve Davis went on to win. Does Eddie Charles still consider himself a real force in international snooker? I've had ten months in England uh, of this season. It's been it's been a very good ten months. There's 112 professionals in the world now, and I'm currently number three. Uh, so I'm quite happy with the way things have gone, but some of these young players are extremely good and, uh, you know, very good for their age. Steve Davis, the present world professional champion, is, is a very, very good player. Jimmy White, who was uh, beaten in the final, um, not so consistent as Steve, but also a, a brilliant player on his day. Eddie, are you still as keen as you ever were? Absolutely. Um, I jog six miles every morning before breakfast. I get a swim every day if I can fit it in. Uh, I exercise to keep fit, then my practice program is four hours a day besides the tournaments in the evenings. Uh, and I find you've got to do it to, to be able to, to box on with these young blokes. distribution company. The company will market $100,000 worth of Wyndham Estate wines each year through as many as 225,000 outlets. Two white wines and two red wines have been picked for export. The 83 Chablis Superior, 83 Tramina Riesling, a Pinot Noir and a Cabernet Shiraz. Market research was conducted suggesting that the sweet Tramina will be the biggest seller amongst the Japanese who are used to wines made from fruit. Six other winemakers, including Tyrrells, are already exporting small amounts to Japan. But Wyndham Estate will be the first to be aggressively marketed on television there. Japan has 300 wineries of its own, and Wyndham's will be competing with them for a relatively small market. Nevertheless, the potential market is huge, and Mr. Brian McGuigan says it is now beginning to be realised as the Japanese westernise and eat more red meat. 
uh, represents to us a breakthrough into the Japanese market and uh, that's very important because the Japanese market potentially is a very, very big one. What's, uh, how much wine do the Japanese drink at the moment? Per capita they consume only a very small quantity, 0.4 of a litre per annum. We Australians consume 20 litres uh, per annum, so potentially uh, you know, we can get it to 40 times what they're drinking at the moment. Locally, hospitals like the Mater and Maitland say they'll run out of linen by Wednesday. If that happens, selective surgery may have to be abandoned and the doors may have to be closed on new admissions. But that, according to the administrators, would be a last option. Allendale Hospital has already stopped admissions as there's only a few days of clean linen left. Most H and REA branches have decided to impose the bans and threaten to strike on June the 1st, and they have received the support of the nurses. At Belmont Hospital, it's an unusual situation with the h and REA members deciding against the bans, but the nurses backing them up on their 38-hour week campaign and imposing bans in support nonetheless. Bans on the collection of money and overtime will also be imposed at some hospitals from midnight. At the biggest hospital in the region, Royal Newcastle, the most telling ban is on the supply of linen to operating theatres, except in emergency situations. Union representatives met the Chief Executive Officer, Dr Elwyn Currow, and some of the action was modified as a result. But still, patient services will be affected. There are one or two bans that will be very significant uh, as far as patient care is concerned. For example, there will be no linen supplied to the operating theatre other than for emergency cases. Now this will apply, as we understand it, from the beginning of next week. This means, in effect, of course, we will have to cancel routine admissions, and if this is what really does eventuate, then we will certainly be in touch with patients to give them the maximum possible notice so that they will be inconvenienced as little as possible. With regard to the other bands, um, for the most part, these will not be affecting patient care significantly, uh, although it will make us more, it's more difficult for us to deliver good patient care uh, to patients. We will be doing our very best to maintain the highest level of patient care that we can under the circumstances imposed on us by the Union Band. After unveiling a plaque, the information centre was open to the public. Other local investments it gives information on are new locomotives, coal wagons, computer signalling and reservations, and station upgrading. I asked Mr Unsworth whether we can expect more new rail projects in the Hunter. In the long term, uh, perhaps we'll extend electrification of the Hunter Valley. It may not be the same system that we brought up from Sydney, but uh, with that, of course, that will provide a basis for improved travel north of Newcastle. Will we ever see an extensive urban service in Newcastle to relieve the pressure on our road system? A lot depends on the population growth. The uh, State Rail Authority continually uh, watching uh, these developments, as is the Ministry of Transport. The 
accident happens near Redhead on Callaroo Road, a narrow, poorly designed road bordered by light industry. to the scene work together to free